So here's some help with the experiment six pre-lab. So first, the first question asks you to find three terms. We'll go through these one by one. The first one is a hydrated double salt. <clears throat> so first let's discuss what a double salt is. And to do that, let's think about just what a regular salt is. So a normal salt, table salt, would be NaCl, sodium chloride. And that's made of one cation, that's a positively charged ion, and one anion, that's a negatively charged anion. So you have one type of cation, sodium here, combining with one type of anion, chlorine here. Okay, with a double salt, you have two different types of cations. In the example I have below, you could also have two different types of anions. So, for example, here you have potassium with a plus one charge, aluminum with a plus three charge, and then you have the sulfate as the, the anion. So you have two types of cations and one type of anion. Those two different types of cations are what makes this a double salt. In a normal salt, you just have one type of cation with one type of anion. Here, you have two types of cations with one type of anion. So that's what a double salt is. Now, a hydrated double salt is just that, but with water sticking to it. So you have some water molecules sticking to those crystals, those salt crystals, and that makes it hydrated. The next term they wanted you to define was trivalent. Now, trivalent means that an atom can uh, connect with three other atoms. So it's telling you about the connection between atoms. If an atom is trivalent, it will be able to connect with three other atoms. Monovalent means you can connect with just one other atom. So an atom or element that's monovalent can connect with just one other atom. Question two asks, why is filter paper used in both the gravity and vacuum filtration techniques? And explain the major differences in the two techniques. So first, both gravity and vacuum filtration are forms of filtration. And filtration is separating things based on size. To do that, you need some sort of a mesh that has holes in it of a certain size, so that only things smaller than those holes can get through the mesh, and anything bigger than the holes will stay behind it. And so that's why you're using filter paper in both gravity and vacuum filtration. You need a mesh to separate things based on size. Now, that's what they share in common. The difference between gravity filtration and vacuum filtration is how you get things through the mesh. On the left here, you can see an example, a picture of gravity filtration, and it's gravity that's pulling your solution through the mesh. On the right, you can see a setup for vacuum filtration. And in this case, you have a vacuum pump connected to your piece of glassware, and that vacuum is sucking air through. And so that's what's going to uh, drive your solution through the filter paper. So those are the major differences between gravity and vacuum filtration. So, question three says, a student obtained an aluminum soda can and cut it into small pieces for a laboratory experiment. The student weighed out 2.3 grams of the aluminum metal to prepare for the synthesis of potassium alum. Calculate the theoretical yield in grams of the synthesized potassium alum that could be produced in the reaction. Note. The molecular mass of KALSO42, so that's potassium alum, dot 12H2O, so that's dodecahydrate, is 474.39 grams per mole. Okay, so when you're given a gigantic paragraph like this, I always find it's easiest to break down what they're giving you and what they're asking for. So here, they're giving you 2.3 grams of aluminum metal. Now, if you look in the reaction, that's on the left. And that would look like that in real life. What they're asking for is to calculate the theoretical yield, how many grams you would get if every atom reacted, of alum. And alum is that first compound after the arrow on the right in the product side. And that's what that would look like. So they give you 2.3 grams of aluminum, and they're asking you how many grams of potassium alum would you get? Okay, now how can we connect these two units? Well, using the 
equation, the balanced chemical equation, we can relate the number of molecules to each other. So for example, for every two aluminum atoms, I know that there are, I'm gonna get two alum molecules. And the number of atoms and molecules is really just the same thing as the number of moles, because moles are groups of atoms and molecules. So I could also say that for every two moles of aluminum, for every two moles of aluminum, I would get two moles of alum. So I can connect the units that way. Those twos in front allow me to connect the moles of aluminum to the moles of alum, and then I just need a way to connect what they give me and what I want to that. So I need to get from grams of aluminum to moles of aluminum. Once I have moles of aluminum, I can get to moles of alum, and once I have moles of alum, I need to get to grams of that. Okay, so each of these black arrows is going to represent a conversion, and for each of every conversion you need a conversion factor that relates the two units. So let's start with this first one on the left. We need to relate grams of aluminum to moles of aluminum, and for that you use the periodic table. So if you look for aluminum on the periodic table, you'd see that it, the atomic mass, the molecular mass below the AL, is around 27. So I can say there's 27 grams of aluminum in every one mole of aluminum. Next, I need to relate moles of aluminum to moles of alum. And like we discussed, you can use those coefficients in front of the compounds of the elements in the balanced equation. So there are two moles of aluminum for every two moles of alum. So I can say, okay, two moles of aluminum is going to equal two moles of alum. That's coming from the balanced equation. Finally, I need to relate moles of alum to grams of alum. Now, usually you would use the periodic table, and because it's a really big compound, that would take a lot of time. In this example, the problem gave you the molecular mass, and in your book it was given in part of the pre-lab, in a table. So here it says that the molecular mass is 474.39 grams per mole. That really means you have 474.39 grams of alum for every one mole of alum. And so we can use that to fill in our conversion factor. Next to moles goes 1, and next to grams goes 474.39. So now that we have all of our conversion factors, we can just take the number they give us to start with of aluminum, 2.3 grams. Whenever you do a conversion, you always write a multiplication sign and a fraction bar. And the units you start with here are grams of aluminum on top. It goes on the bottom so that they'll cancel out. Now I'm going to fill this fraction in with my first conversion factor. Next to grams is going to go 27. Going over the fraction bar is like going across the equal sign, so on top I'm going to write one mole of aluminum. So then grams of aluminum cancels out. I'm left with moles of aluminum, but I want, ultimately, grams of alum. So I have to do another conversion. Every time you do a conversion, write a multiplication sign, a fraction bar, and the units you start with on top here are moles of aluminum goes on the bottom so that it'll cancel out. Now I'm going to fill this in using my second conversion factor. Next to moles of aluminum in that is 2, going over the fraction bars like going across the equal sign. So on top I'm going to write 2 moles of alum. Moles of aluminum cancels out and I'm left with moles of alum. But I want grams of alum, so I have to do another conversion factor another conversion. So I write a for every time you do a conversion, you write a multiplication sign, a fraction bar, and the units you start with on top, here moles of alum, goes on the bottom so that it'll cancel out. I'm going to fill this in with my last conversion factor. So next to moles of alum goes 1, going over the fraction bar, it's like going across the equal sign. So on top of the fraction I'm going to write 474.39 grams of alum. Moles of alum cancels out, and I'm left with grams of alum which is what I want. Now, there is, it could be a question on how you would plug something like this into a calculator. I recommend you press enter after every step. So for example, you would, you would type in 2.3 times 1, enter, divided by 27, enter, times 2, enter, divided by 2, enter, times 474.39, enter, divided by 1 enter. And that should give you the right answer. If you try to plug all the numbers in in a, uh, what might seem like a faster way, sometimes the order of operations on your calculator will give you the wrong answer. So to be safe, I would just do one step at a time, press enter after every step. So that is the theoretical amount of alum you could get. That's your theoretical yield. 
if every single atom that you had in those 2.3 grams of aluminum reacted and you didn't lose anything at all to glassware or to evaporation or anything, then you would get 40.41 grams of alum. The next question asks if the student in question three, the one we just did, reported that at the end of the experiment, they collected 15.63 grams of alum. What is the percent yield of the reaction? The percent yield. Percent yield is the actual yield. That's what you actually got when you went in the lab. Over the theoretical yield. That's what we just calculated. What you would get if every atom reacted with every other atom and nothing was lost in filter paper or through evaporation or through spilling. Times 100 because it's a percent. So percent yield is actual yield over theoretical yield times 100. So here, the actual yield, what the student got when they were really in the lab, was 15.63 grams of alum. The theoretical yield, which we found in the previous question, is 40.41 grams of alum. So we're going to take that, multiply it by 100, and we'll get 38.68% yield.